Hello, and welcome to Our Future in Space. I'm your host, Dr. Jeff Greenblatt. I'm the Vice President for Science and Research at Orbital Assembly Corporation. In this podcast, we explore the technical, economic, social, political, and ethical considerations of moving human beings into the solar system because our species is at an inflection point in its evolution. For the past two or more decades, we've been able to sustain human life in low Earth orbit and will soon be able to do so throughout the solar system. This is happening for several reasons. Because of the falling cost of launch, the exponential growth of computation, the rapid commercialization of low Earth orbit, and a growing concern that uh, humans are outstripping our planet's resources and something new is needed. Do we merely survive or do we expand outwards and thrive? I'm here with my co-host, Eric Ward, who's the Vice President for Engineering Design at OAC. How's it going, Eric? Oh, it's going just great. I'm really excited for our interview. Today, our guest is Frank White. Frank has authored or co-authored numerous books on topics ranging from space exploration to climate change to artificial intelligence. His best known work, The Overview Effect, Space Exploration and Human Evolution, is considered by many to be a seminal work in the field of space exploration. Frank has long advocated for developing a new philosophy of space exploration and has recently published his book on this topic, The Cosma Hypothesis, Implications of the Overview Effect. Frank is also co-founder and president of the Human Space Program, a central project to develop a citizen-authored blueprint for conscious space migration and stewardship of the solar ecosystem. Frank White, thank you for joining us. Welcome to our future in space. Thank you, Eric. It's great to be here. And hi, Jeff. How are you? Hi. Doing really well, Frank. Good to Good. see you again. Good to see you so guys. So for, uh, for our viewers and listeners uh, that, that don't already know, could you uh, tell them what the overview effect is and, and talk a little bit about why it's so important? Yeah, um, briefly, I would say that it's an experience, it's a theory, and it's an idea, and it's become a movement. So it's a complicated phenomenon. However, to simplify it a little bit, uh, it's now defined as an experience of astronauts, cosmonauts, and other space travelers as they see the Earth from space and in space. Uh, from space, meaning low Earth orbit or on a suborbital hop. In space, really meaning on a lunar mission when you see the planet against the backdrop of the cosmos. P.S., I do want to say, the original hypothesis was not about astronauts like Karen Nyberg, whom I've interviewed for my book, but about future space denizens, if we will, or mm. uh, space dwellers who might live in an O'Neill community and see the Earth in the sky all the time. Mm. And I, I thought people like that would always have an overview they would see the Earth as a whole system, as complete, integrated, interconnected. They would have a higher level of awareness than we do. There were no such people at the time. And uh, I guess if we have our way, there will be in the future. I think that's what we're working on. Yeah. Uh, but um, I realized I had to interview astronauts to see if I could confirm the hypothesis. So they confirmed a lot of it, but as we talk more, I'll tell you what is different about astronauts and future space dwellers, because it is an important distinction. Sure, well, please elaborate. But, okay. Um, what like? um, yeah, so for me, these future people, and I, you know, as I said, I hope we'll get to see it happen. Uh, I would even like to imagine I would be one. Uh, they would not consider it extraordinary to see the earth in the sky. It would just be there, like the moon is in our sky. So although it seems quite extraordinary to us to talk about the overview effect, the original image, and there you go, there's the earth from the moon, the original hypothesis was they would just have this knowledge of what the earth is without thinking about it every day. Well, when I interviewed astronauts, that's different. Every astronaut to date was born on the earth. 
they return to Earth unless, well, we did have some astronauts die or cosmonauts die, um, and, and we've lost people, but the intent was always to come home. And so when they saw the planet from a distance, it was extraordinary. Uh -huh. and, and that's the whole new hypothesis, which is, oh, if we could, quote unquote, bring the overview effect down to Earth, perhaps we can shift the awareness of our entire planet, even those living here on, on this first space community. Uh, this <laughs> is our first one. Uh, you know, whoever lives on the moon, that'll be the second and so on. But it led to an entirely new idea, which I think is quite profound, which is it will change consciousness in a good way. And in fact, the further out we move, we will find that space exploration is mostly about changing human consciousness. And it's never going to stop. It'll keep happening. OK, so I want you to dig in a little bit what is this change in human consciousness that you expect or that individual astronauts have experienced? You, you sort yeah. of described it as profound, but yeah, can we dig in a little to what kinds of feelings it's brought up for people? And Yeah. Well, one important distinction to make is this. When I interviewed Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon, he asked me, because I had interviewed some astronauts before him, he asked me, what have you learned? Like a good teacher. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I thought everybody would have the same experience, but no, everyone's having a different experience. It's not homogeneous, it's heterogeneous. He said, no, I would just correct you and say, we all had the same experience, um, but it goes through the belief system, it's processed mm -hmm. and it's explained differently. And I, I'm kind of mangling the beauty of what he said, but that's the essence of it. So, in fact, uh, every astronaut and cosmonaut tends to explain the experience differently, but there are these commonalities. Many of them say, I knew there were no borders or boundaries on the Earth. I knew that. But honestly, I, I thought when I looked down, I would see the little lines and... Uganda would be pink and you know <laughs> Tanzania would be green and uh, no it didn't happen that way and it just shocked me and then almost every astronaut says do you know how thin the astronaut uh, the atmosphere is it's it's like that uh, Jeff Hoffman put it well he said you look up into the blue sky from earth it seems to go on forever and then you look at it from orbit and it doesn't, it's paper thin, microscopically yeah. thin. Uh, and also they talk about what that leads them to feel and believe. And one is there are no borders or boundaries. What are we fighting over? Very pertinent right now. I mean, we, mm -hmm. we literally have people dying right now over borders and boundaries in a very big way. And uh, many of the astronauts, the shift is, again, intellectually, you, I think we all know it's ridiculous to be fighting over borders and boundaries in Europe, but experientially they feel it. And then they, they experientially feel the need to take care of planet Earth and they frequently say, and this is really important to me, we're all in this together. It's a bit of a cliche, but if you think about what that means, it means everything I do affects billions of people, life forms, the earth. And it, it's a responsibility they, they return with. And finally, I would say, um, Perhaps the most important distinction here is what we know mentally and intellectually and what we know experientially, which is something we could talk about. It, it's not unique to astronauts. I mean, the astronauts often will say, 
It's the difference between hearing about the Grand Canyon, seeing pictures of the Grand Canyon, and going to the Grand Canyon. <laughs> and uh, right, yeah, I went to the Grand Canyon just because astronauts kept telling me that, and they're right. I mean, <laughs> there's no way, there's nothing you can do to fully prepare yourself for seeing it. So, so basically, what you're saying is that. People didn't expect to have this experience. They went with already the knowledge that the Earth was one contiguous body, that we all need to take care of the planet, but somehow it kind of hit them between the eyes, so to speak, when they actually went up and saw it. And it's not just a, uh, a, a feeling that lasted a few minutes or even the duration of the space flight, but lingered essentially permanently once they returned to Earth. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm now getting astronauts to admit that they cried when they first saw the Earth from space. I now mm -hmm. have four astronauts on record saying that. I even have one astronaut saying every astronaut did. I think <laughs> I think I'm telling the truth. Hmm. We may uh, have lost Frank for a moment. Oh, here we go. Yeah. I think what's important, here. yeah. I think, mm -hmm. I think what's important is the fact that it's emotional. Experiences are emotional; uh, they're not cognitive and intellectual. Although we talk about it as a cognitive shift, I really think we should call it an experiential shift or mm -hmm. cognitive and emotional, because behavior usually doesn't change based on intellect. It usually changes based on uh, feelings and experiences and emotions. And what we're saying here is that we need to change our behavior on earth. And, you know, this goes to the human space program. As we move outward into the solar system, we need to have a different mindset, different behavior, or we are not going to do a good job with the solar ecosystem and there you know that's our website of the human space program we're seeking sustainable ethical and inclusive stewardship of the solar ecosystem and the important aspect of that is i always like to remind everyone the earth is part of the solar system or the solar ecosystem so we're not talking about leaving earth we're not talking about abandoning Earth. And Jeff, you and I can go into this. We're talking about helping the Earth by expanding from a solar, I mean, from a terrestrial ecosystem to a solar ecosystem. So these are all very important aspects of it. And I do believe that my other hypothesis will be confirmed that is to say, I do believe people who live off the planet and, and see not only the earth, but the universe differently will be different. I, I think I know how they'll be different, but I'm not totally sure. Uh, you know, I'm not saying they won't be human, although we could get into that because over time, we may see a new species arise, but I really do think we're gonna have a, a, a change in consciousness mm -hmm. and it may be subtle. I mean, it may not be obvious um, once it occurs. And, and part of what your effort is, and I'd like to hear you talk more about the goals of the human space program, you know, and your books, but, uh, this idea of giving more people the opportunity to experience the overview effect, uh, getting folks into space, right? Even yeah. suborbitally, or, or not even suborbitally, we, we, we have a few companies who are trying to get people up in a balloon simply right. high enough to be able to experience the curvature and the thesis is right. that there will be an overview effect that is uh, received. If, yeah. if, you're, if you'd like to elaborate a little more on those efforts and why they're important, yeah. I'd love to hear mm -hmm. that. Yeah, so the overview effect has been, over time, we've honed it and refined it. And we've said it's an astronaut experience. You know, 
I think it, it in its most powerful manifestation, it involves being weightless because I think that contributes to it. Um, it involves uh, seeing the earth uh, from a distance and essentially being suborbital or orbital or going to the moon, which is really the peak. However, I think that what's going on with Space Perspective, an organization with, with which I do have a connection and worldview is very helpful. And, and they, you know, the, the people who founded Space Perspective, uh, Jane and Tabor, have been influenced by the overview effect for many, many years. And they're trying to give people a, a feeling for that. So what I'm getting at is, I don't believe everyone has to experience the absolute complete overview effect to create the change of consciousness mm -hmm. on the planet. We also wanna talk about virtual reality. People are working hard to recreate the experience there. And there's mm -hmm. this new, there's this new experience called the infinite which is beyond just putting the goggles on. It is an experience. And I've heard people talk about it being as close to the real thing as you can get. Um, wow. So that's really encouraging. Uh, Nicole Stott, who's experienced the real thing, uh, did say the infinite was amazingly close. Uh, the point being, uh, whatever we can do to get people... 50%, 60, 70, 80, 100% of it, uh, it's going to be positive, I believe. And uh, of course, you know, that's why I'm supportive of Orbital Assembly, because mm -hmm. um, if you all succeed, the, the other part of the, the perspective here is if we can go beyond uh, missions to migration, if we can go from flights to going somewhere, and staying there, mm -hmm. that's going to be to the good. I want to add one thing that might be helpful to the audience here. I really thought I'd had an Einsteinian moment here, guys, where I thought I could bring the overview effect down to an equation. And the equation oh. was I, let's see if I could get it, I equals D times T plus O. And that meant impact equals distance times time plus openness to the experience. In other words, mm -hmm. if you go to the moon, even though Edgar Mitchell said we all had the same experience, he agreed that orbital versus uh, the moon is different. And mm -hmm. going to the moon has a bigger impact for the most part. But then I thought, okay, so distance is important. Time is important. How long are you there? And openness, which Mitchell said to me, openness to the experience is the most important variable. So I had all that together. And uh, maybe you can guess what uh, torpedoed my equation. It's a recent <laughs> flight. I won't put you on the spot. It was Bill Shatner. Oh. Uh -huh. so Shatner, <laughs> Captain Kirk goes on a Blue Origin flight, mm -hmm. not very high up, not very yep. long. He comes back. He's changed, right? <laughs> yeah, to, to any of our viewers and listeners that, that haven't seen that, I would definitely go look up the you know, the, the landing pre uh, proceedings from that flight, Bill Shatner just goes on for half an hour at least, just waxing poetic about the experience. And you can really tell how impactful it was to him. And, yeah. you know, I could I can imagine he, you know, he only, I, I think what you're saying, Frank, is he only went to the suborbital flight, right? right? He didn't go to the moon, he didn't go into orbit, and it still had this, you know, amazingly impactful experience for him. So I would say the equation is generally accurate, but I've now, instead of saying plus openness, I've saying times openness. Times openness, and, right. 
You, you're both scientists. You know distance and time are objective numbers. Openness, mm -hmm. I suppose we could find a way to put it in the model. But openness actually could well be the most important. Uh, because sure. people are always telling me, oh, I talked to such and such an astronaut. He said nothing happened. You know, mm -hmm. he did. I didn't experience the overview effect. And I always say, well, I, you know, I, I don't think he was open to it. I don't know that person. I've never interviewed an astronaut who said nothing happened. But the other important thing is, again, going back to being a scientist, I've tried to be a social scientist here. Even though I call myself a space philosopher, I was trained as a social scientist. So all of this is a, hypoth hy a hypothesis, right? And we need right. to get data. So. I had people telling me there is no way you could experience the overview effect on a suborbital flight. And my response was, I only know about two orbital uh, suborbital flights, and that was Shepard and Grissom. Maybe there were some others. I don't know. But we don't have a lot of data, so let's see what happens. I've now talked to one, two, three. I've talked to three Blue Origin astronauts. It's clear it had a big impact. And, you know, Dylan Taylor, who's my publisher, said to me openly in my interview, which was after the flight, he said, if anybody asks you, can you experience the overview effect on a suborbital flight? I'm here to tell you, yes. Mm. And if anybody wants to look it up, it's, uh, it's actually on YouTube. I did it before and after with Dylan. So mm -hmm. we need to we need to be open. We need to to say we don't know everything yet. The overview sure. effect is a hypothetical. Uh, mm -hmm. The data seems to confirm its reality. Let's keep getting more information, and we're going to get a flood of it now with the new commercial flights. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. yeah, and I mean it's. So it doesn't impact everyone to the same degree. I mean, so what, right? I mean, w w right. And, and I also want to be clear, it sounds like a major motivation for you of getting people into space is to experience the overview effect and the consciousness shift toward what? Right. Toward more, more cooperation, more stewardship of the earth, other things that we feel are solely lacking, sorely yeah. lacking in our society. But beyond that, there's probably some other good reasons to go to space, right? Yeah. Besides the overview effect, do you yeah. um, want to well, touch on any of those? Yes, I can. Uh, I could touch on a lot of the ones that people typically talk about, but I, I'm more interested, if, if you will, in talking about one other big picture reason, and that's large-scale space migration. Um, Jeff, you know about this, and I've done a lot of work recently thinking about limits to growth and other environmental analyses mm -hmm. that suggest humanity has passed the carrying capacity of our, our planet. Um, mm -hmm. Limits to growth is an interesting study done in the 70s. It was originally a computer modeling project where several scenarios were run looking at would humanity overshoot the carrying capacity of the planet and what implications would it have? Interestingly enough, Jerry O'Neill was impacted by that study mm. because he immediately saw that if the implications of that were taken into account, the only way to deal with it was incredible restrictions on human freedom, creativity, and opportunity. And that's when he started thinking about space communities and developing the idea of these communities at the Lagrange points between the Earth and the Moon built out of extraterrestrial materials. And I've said it once, I'll say it again, no O'Neill, no overview effect, because 
my idea of the overview effect was on a cross-country flight thinking about O'Neill and his thought and his ideas and what it would be like to live in one of these communities, which is now being shown on the screen. And I have come to the conclusion that I believe large-scale space migration should be seen as an environmental initiative. Um, O'Neill had a very strong penchant for environmentalism and came up with this idea of returning the earth to an Eden-like state by moving people and industry off the planet. And um, interestingly enough, Jeff Bezos talks about the same thing. And yes. people, people negate Jeff Bezos because they object to his labor practices or his personality, but they don't look at what he's talking about doing. And actually Shatner tried to talk about it to Bezos when he came back and he, he said, you know, we got to put all the polluting industries up there and, you know, and <laughs> we got to, we got to do that and everything. So um, I've been giving a lot of thought to that. And I believe that we're going to have to move millions, if not billions of people to ease the impact on the earth. And Jeff, I don't know if I can reveal that you've worked on this, but sure. you know, uh, you and I have talked about this. We want to build a computer model that would extend limits to growth into the solar ecosystem. Um, and I know that you've done work on how many O'Neill communities could we build mm -hmm. just using asteroids, right? And that's right. Now, what is important about that? What is important about that is this. If we succeed in Elon Musk's vision of a million people on Mars, it's really not going to help the environmental situation on Earth because we've got 8 billion people and a million people on Mars may have a big impact on the carrying capacity of Mars, but it may not help the Earth. Whereas easing, easing environmental pressures, that is right. assuming that those 1 million people are consuming the average in amount of resources, and they probably would be consuming more, you know, if they tend yeah. to be wealthy. The point is that even a million moved off isn't going to make much of a difference to Earth's yeah. uh, environmental problems. Yeah, I'd agree. But, you know, if we focus on the O'Neill vision, and if it can be made a reality, we could, um, we could give many, many, let's put it this way. Rather than talking about moving people off the planet, which is more, uh, I don't know, more like forcing, if we could give people an opportunity for a new op a new life out there mm -hmm. in the solar ecosystem, uh, you know, that would be a good thing, not only for them, but for the earth. And, you know, the other thing is the human space program, we've thought a lot about the ethical issues of terraforming Mars, mm -hmm. uh, the issues involved in putting a lot of people on the moon and so on. A lot of these issues can be um, dealt with because we could have a much lighter footprint on planetary bodies and, mm -hmm. and focus more on the O'Neill type communities. And, you know, O'Neill very intelligently said, you've just gotten out of the gravity well of Earth. Why do you want to get into the gravity well of another planet? And the whole idea is in these, these communities, you can get almost anywhere without a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. You have solar energy coming in easily uh, trapped and used. And... Um, Again, if they're built at the Lagrange point, they're not that far from the Earth. Uh, you know, you can remind people where the Lagrange points are relative to uh, the Earth or Moon. Yeah, well, there's about five of them, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff. You may 
know this better you got than it. I do. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, they're essentially uh, pretty close to lunar orbit. Uh, some of them are between the Earth and the Moon, but I don't think any of them are outside of the lunar orbit, are they? No. The, yeah. the, if we're talking about the Earth-Moon Lagrange points, of which mm -hmm. there are five, that's they're all approximately as far from us as the Moon is. Mm -hmm. um, right. Now, there are also some solar Earth Lagrange points that are much right. further away, but right. that's not the ones we're talking about. Yeah. In any event, I, I feel like it's really important to mm -hmm. consider all of this and to think of the ethics of humanity's expansion because we don't want to make mistakes we've already made. And then 500 years from now, we're trying to fix the mistakes. And we've already done a pretty, we've already made a pretty big mistake in, in Earth orbit, which is, you know, uh, debris from all the satellites and other systems we put there. Yeah. That's a good example of what we don't want. And yet, I think without some awareness and consciousness, we'll start making the same errors again. And I mean, the great thing about human beings is we can make mistakes and we do, but with awareness and knowledge, we can also avoid them and correct them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Right. That's the hopeful view, of course. And <laughs> it's true that, you know, Time is long and there are many humans. Uh, also, space is very large. So, you know, let's hope we don't screw up low Earth orbit because that's kind of the gateway to all of space. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, there are a lot of places in space that we could uh, build and locate people as well as operations um, and hopefully not uh, endanger our environment in the same way yeah. that we're doing on Earth. Um, yeah, and I think one encouraging factor is that partly in, in, in response to the famous Earthrise picture and other Apollo uh, communications by astronauts, we have strongly moved in an environmental direction. I'm old enough to have lived through the Apollo missions, and I can tell you that there was a change in consciousness worldwide. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there are some debunkers who want to say uh, the world wasn't really brought together by Apollo. It wasn't really something everybody supported. And I agree with that. But, you know, from 1968 on to now, that image, as someone has pointed out, that was the first picture of humanity. I mean, everybody was in that picture mm -hmm. <laughs> except mm -hmm. three people. Um, right. There were three humans not in that picture, but everybody else was in it. And I do believe that over time, it's become an icon along with mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the, the pale blue dot and the blue marble pictures that has continually reinforced the environmental movement. And it's unfortunate that the environmental movement and the space movement are not closer and that's why at the Human Space Program, we say we're the environmentalist of the space movement. Mm -hmm. uh, we really mm -hmm. don't want to ever let go of the importance of planet Earth and spaceship Earth, if you will. That might be a good segue for you to talk a little more about the specific goals of your Human Space mm -hmm. Program. Okay. You know, the blueprint that you, yeah, yeah you want to get. Well, and I, and I think it's important to say that it didn't just appear as a different idea. Uh, the idea of the human space program originated as I was finishing the book, uh, the first edition of the Overview Effect in 1987. It was pretty clear that exploring the universe was much too big a job for one country or one company or any uh, anybody in particular, it should be a central project for all of humanity. And I got the idea of a central project. A friend of mine named Bruce Shackleton, uh, he claims he's not related to the great explorer, but I think he <laughs> is. Anyway, 
He gave me an article in which I believe Willis Harmon, who was close to Edgar Mitchell and uh, was, I believe, president of Institute of Noetic Sciences for a while. Uh, Harmon talked about central projects as these really big projects that engaged entire societies and brought out the very best in societies. And they had a spiritual dimension, but they were very physical in nature. And I guess the Gothic cathedrals could be a simple example of that. Uh, not mm -hmm. simple, but good example. Uh, and, and in that article, it also talked as, uh, that Apollo was a central project. So the human space program I conceived of as a central project for all of humanity to explore the universe through this millennium. And I put it in there and I put down 20 starter, starter projects as part of the central project. And I waited for somebody to say, that's a great idea. I think I'll take responsibility for that. And then it was in the second edition and I waited. <laughs> it was in the third edition and I waited. And then I decided, I guess I have to do it. And in the meantime, I had tried to get Harvard to do something like that because I was working at Harvard and I'm an, an alumnus of Harvard. And I thought all the faculties of Harvard could contribute to looking at the issues that await us as we expand off the planet. And I got pretty far with that, but the whole project took another leap when Arani Poro, who is executive director of the uh, Krista McAuliffe Center at Framingham State University, said, let's make it an academic effort, not just Harvard. Mm -hmm. And then I presented it at a reunion at Harvard and one of my classmates, Ted Fields said, let's make it, let's get business and space agencies and into it, let's get everybody involved. And that became the Human Space Program, which is now a nonprofit incorporated in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And the, the essence of it is going back to that original Harvard idea 16 different task forces that will tackle these issues like ethics, governance, economics, uh, all the different issues that we might think of as we move out into the solar ecosystem. And we call it a central project to develop a citizen authored blueprint for conscious space migration and stewardship of the solar ecosystem. And we want it to be inclusive, sustainable, and ethical. But we want to figure out a way for these task forces to include as many people as possible. And once they've done their work, it'll be uh, shared with the secretariat, which is the, the sort of central management of the project. And we will put together this blueprint that will suggest how we ought to move outward uh, and minimize mistakes and maximize benefits. And then, as you mentioned, we want to test it with simulations. Uh, we want to run simulations, which will be, the core would be a computer simulation, but that would create the opportunity for people to take on different roles and, and play out different scenarios and see what would really work. And that's what will make it really different from as some of our, some of the skeptics say, how can you avoid it being just another report? Uh, right. One final mm -hmm. unique part, we do want to create a database that would be available to everyone uh, and, and the public that would include all information we can find that's relevant to large-scale space migration. So it's an ambitious project, but that's why it sure it's, is. Long, it's a long project. 
So you have this timeline, it sounds like built in. You said that we're gonna do these 16 task forces are going to kind of do their work and then there will be a report to your secretariat and there will be dissemination. Mm -hmm. Are you picturing this taking how long? I mean, or is it more of an open-ended process? That's a really good question and we're evolving on that. I mean, originally we thought the task force would be small groups of people uh, and we'd give them a year and a half and then they would submit their report. Um, it may be somewhat nonlinear by comparison in the sense that the task forces may be in action and drawing on the repository of knowledge and beginning to create, actually beginning to create the blueprint in real time. And the blueprint might be contained within the computer model, if you see what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. in, in essence, the, the blueprint may be a, a living document that can be tested and, and, uh, and we can simulate as we go along. Uh, we'll have to see. Sure. Uh, at the minimum, uh, we will have the task forces report to the secretariat and they will produce a real report and then we'll test it so it'll be more linear. One thing I would say is uh, we know we have a um, overview roundtable that meets every Wednesday and talks about issues like this. And we have been testing the concept and we created five what we call proto task forces. And they went off and came up in four months. They came up with reports and, uh, and then they reported back. And I have recently put that together into a PowerPoint presentation, and we are going to run a simulation against it. So um, we are kind of <clears throat> testing it out now. And it's, it's really interesting because we've gotten a lot of insight into what happens when you give a group of people uh, a set of questions, which is what we did. We said, these are the questions. You're the ethics task force give us some answers and off they went. And uh, <laughs> we didn't interfere at all. And they kind of elected mm -hmm. their own leaders and every, every task force operated differently, interestingly enough. Mm -hmm. Every proto task force, I should yeah. say. Yeah. That's really interesting. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, some results of those initial simulations and yeah. find that yeah, very interesting and important way to kind of address some of these bigger questions on a kind of systems level is, you know, we can't just go out there and try, you know, three different ways of, of you know, expanding into the solar ecosystem, you know, <laughs> yeah. in person. But um, I, I think it's a really, really smart approach. And it'll be very interesting to see how these turn out. You know, it well, could end up being a, a kind of a gaming environment. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, my... This goes back to the experience and experiential mm -hmm. learning. Um, you know, I, I teach courses in Harvard Extension School, and uh, I've taught one course on space, uh, and I've taught multiple courses on fundraising and communications. I always have a simulation team structure so that all my students join a hypothet hypothetical mm -hmm team, they're then giving a problem that they work on until the end of the course, and then they make a presentation. And consistently, people say, I learned so much from working for small college or large university mm -hmm. or find a cure. Um, and I'm trying to remember the names of my space groups. There was a lunar settlement group, a Martian settlement group, mm -hmm. and an O'Neill group. But um, similarly, uh, if as we build the human space program out, more and more people could be experientially involved in it, that's a way of spreading the word about how important mm -hmm. this moment is. I think you talked right. about our species being at an inflection point. I mean, I can tell you that, Eric, and I can say that, <laughs> yeah. Jeff, but 
if if I make you the president of Mars, of the Mars city, and I force you to go through some kind of simulation mm -hmm. and you experience it, you're going to have a different feeling for it. Oh, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even if we're not really there, you're saying just the, the forcing people to think through real life uh, yeah. uh, choices and uh, issues that are going to arise as we move into space with some technical realism, I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, well, you know, people, yeah. have, people have studied gaming um, mm -hmm. and it's been found that although gaming gets a bad rap from people, you know, they think it's, it's uh, spoiling our youth. Most of the studies show that gaming actually is pretty beneficial for mm -hmm. people as a learning tool. And that once people are in a game, like a computer game, it becomes real, you know? Yeah. And I've often said to my students at Harvard, like one of, one of the uh, challenges is for a fundraising course. And I've said, I'm gonna play the part of a prospect for your cause. Mm -hmm. If at the end of your talk, I want to give to you as if you're a real organization, you'll be successful. And I have experienced that wanting to give, mm -hmm. even though it's a game and I know it's not mm -hmm. real. I've mm -hmm. come away wishing that that organization existed. <laughs> yeah. So Go I off and found it now. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it, it, it's a powerful way to teach. Mm. Yeah. So well, and I it's want also to, a. Oh, go ahead. Jeff. Oh, yeah. sorry, Eric. I'll just say one more point on this, which is, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think one of the things that uh, OAC uh, says uh, increasingly externally, but certainly uh, internally, is we want to make space for everyone. You know, how do we make mm -hmm. space, the space adventure, a more inclusive community when the bottom line is we, we need a lot of hardcore engineers to make it a reality at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But over time, we open that window to really accept people from all different perspectives, backgrounds, and skills to yeah. contribute. And I think that's part yeah. of what you're doing, Frank, is you're creating this yeah. environment where people from different backgrounds can contribute in a meaningful way today, even yeah. if it isn't real yet. They're yeah. imagining that it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you know, that's why I'm on the advisory council for Orbital Assembly and working with you, uh, because I see what you're doing as, you know, it's the practical, in the short term, the practical manifestation of large scale space migration. But I'm also mm -hmm. very impressed, Jeff and Eric, that you're doing this podcast, which shows mm -hmm. that you see the bigger picture. And I think we need that in order mm -hmm. to do it right. So it's, yeah. it's remarkable that you, I mean, I couldn't build, I couldn't build a, <laughs> a spacecraft. I can, uh, if you just talk to my wife about how handy I am around the house, um, <laughs> you would know I can't help you on that side. Of you know, but uh, uh, I can contribute to the philosophical side, perhaps. But yeah, I mean, if it's mm -hmm. not for everybody, what are we doing? Right? Yeah. I mean, that's the inclusive right. side. Um, and uh, everybody that I work with in the space movement has bought into that. Uh, that, and you know, Space for Humanity. I'm on their advisory board, and they wrote. They recently announced their first citizen astronaut, and mm -hmm. their whole uh, mission is to open up the space environment for everybody, starting with people who compete for a seat on one of these carriers. Mm -hmm. But the larger vision, as stated by the founder, Dylan Taylor, is democratization of space. And, you know, we can say that. It's like saying we're all in this together. But then that raises all the questions we're trying to answer, which is how is Elon Musk going to choose the million people? He doesn't mm -hmm. say. He he doesn't say. Um, I think he says there's plenty of volunteers, and he doesn't <laughs> expect there to be a shortage. But right. I don't know. 
But well, then the Mars One project uh, verified yeah. that. You know, yeah. we know, we know there are a lot of people who are interested, but let's just say, let's say since we're interested in the O'Neill style communities, mm -hmm. let's say we had someone. If you're out there, let us know. Uh, let's say we had someone who'd like to invest in us doing that. And we were the, the three of us got to choose who would be the first citizens. Well, we'd have to face all of these issues and mm -hmm. we'd have to decide what it meant to be inclusive and what it meant to open right. space to all. And mm -hmm. so right now we're still in the philosophical stages, but I mean, pretty soon, assuming you and some of the other companies are able to mm -hmm. to create what are being called private space stations, the issues will come up. And uh, sure, yeah, and that's good. good though. That's what yeah. that's what we need is to get oh. out of science fiction into science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And, and yeah, especially, you know, talking about these issues now, thinking about them, you know, like we're, we're going to come up with a lot of really interesting ideas and creative solutions. And once, you know, once we're actually in the thick of it and humans are going into space and migrating off the planet, we're going to realize that a lot of the things that we expected might not be true, you right. know, but but yeah. at least, you know, having these conversations now, creating these frameworks and, and you know, these ways of thinking of it, I think will really kind of get us off on the right foot. And I mean, that's a large reason that Jeff and I are doing this, this, you know, this podcast and video series is, you know, we're, we really want to make sure that, you know, we as humanity are thinking about these issues now, you know, because it's, it's going to be, you know, coming up with us really quickly. That's right. We well, want to get in front because I'm sorry, just to say, uh, yeah. uh, we want to have these conversations with a mm -hmm. diversity of people now because we haven't thought of everything and no, no one mm -hmm. person, no one organization has, right? right? So to the extent that we can open and open the conversation to uh, as wide a variety of topics as possible, hopefully we will at least catch more of yeah, the nuances. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe that'll give us some things to think, oh, I hadn't really thought of that. But that's a really yeah. important, uh, you know, whatever the point is, um, bef before it's not so yeah. much too late, but so that we have a chance to influence it in a positive direction. Yeah. So. One one analogy I've used that seems to resonate with people <clears throat> is just to say, you know, on planet Earth, we have developers and we have planners. Mm -hmm. And we need both. And mm -hmm. sometimes they're in conflict. Sometimes they work together. But essentially, they play different roles. When we think about the solar ecosystem, the human space program, we want to be the planners. And Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and I guess Orbital Assembly and a host of others are the developers. Mm -hmm. If it's just the human space program, it's just science fiction. You know, if, if it's just the developers, well, we've seen how that works out on Earth. And mm -hmm. ideally, <laughs> you know, <laughs> ideally the two work together and, yeah. and effectively. Um, and I think that's a pretty good analogy. I, mm -hmm. we don't, we at human space program, for example, we don't oppose space development. You know, we, yeah. we're not, well, we're pretty openly not in favor of just staying on the earth. Although we would run that simulation. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I would like to see a simulation where nobody leaves. And, yeah. and I'd love to see how it turns out. But yeah. based on I'm sure a lot of environmentalists would, too, because yeah. there's so many concerns of over, you know, yeah. over um, uh, over consumption of all mm -hmm. kinds of natural resources, both, you know, yeah. animate and inanimate. I think there are great concerns yeah. about what that looks like if you go forward one or two centuries. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and I think it would be, uh, if we were to create this model that we've been talking about, and I hope we will, that would be a scenario we ought to run. What if yeah. nobody go? What if we banned space travel tomorrow? Mm -hmm. I actually saw a poll in England 
shortly after Jeff Bezos and uh, Sir Richard Branson flew, where there was very strong sentiment that what to ban any further flights like that. Wow. <laughs> I think it was it was to ban billionaires. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm sure there are people who uh, who would vote for that. This is a great picture, if I could comment on it. No, please. Yeah, can you describe it? Because not yeah. everyone can see. Yeah. So um, this was, uh, I was invited to NASA in 2019 to interview astronauts. And the, the main reason was for the fourth edition of, mm -hmm. of my book. And uh, so... Uh, I interviewed seven astronauts in uh, the studio, and then I interviewed three who were actually on the International Space Station mm. at the time. Wow. And uh, yeah, so I'd never interviewed astronauts in the act. You know, yeah. they weren't they weren't really looking out the window, but or in the cupola, uh, but uh, they were they were on the ISS. And uh, so that was really a great thing to do. And, you know, the other innovation now is I'm starting to interview the new astronauts before and after mm -hmm. their flight, which I hadn't done before. And it, it's a really, I mean, one of the great things about this overview effect theory is there's always something more to do. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Jeff, I think, and Jeff and Eric, I think you're going to interview Anahita Nazami, uh, psychologist, and we're talking about how could we actually measure brain waves and measure physiological mm -hmm. responses uh, as people experience their first look out the cupola. Oh wow! Oh, that'd be fascinating. Oh wow! And mm -hmm. compare that. Ask that question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, People have asked me in the past, can you have the same experience without leaving Earth? And I said, no, I don't think so, because there's so many different elements to being in orbit or on the moon, mm -hmm. including being weightless or reduced gravity. And on the other hand, we could, in theory, measure uh, brain waves and physiological reactions in orbit and then compare it to, uh, let's say, virtual reality experience yeah. or meditators or people praying, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So, so I, I want to change tactics a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's a lot of questions left. Um, you know, another one of your books is on the Cosma hypothesis, and we haven't really talked about that. I was wondering if you could, if you could give us kind yeah. of an overview of the Cosma hypothesis, and we could chat about yeah. that a little bit. Well, as you've probably come to understand, I boldly go where no one wants to go, intellectually. <laughs> um, sometimes, sometimes I get, uh, uh, you know, sometimes I get. Uh, not attacked, but questioned, like, mm -hmm. do you really have the right to ask these questions? And mm -hmm. and I say, yes, I, I think so. Um, and the Cosmo hypothesis was a great example of that because as I've said uh, in the past, I was not trained as a philosopher. Uh, my training was as a social scientist. How did I start calling myself a space philosopher? Well. I was finishing up the first edition of the overview effect as the Challenger accident occurred. We were all uh -huh. traumatized by that. And I was literally the weekend after it happened, I was watching this week with David Brinkley and they had Isaac Asimov on and they had Tom Wolfe who wrote the right stuff and they had George Will, a uh, well-known talking head. And uh, he, he asked a pertinent question. They were talking about, where do we go from here? We've lost these wonderful people. Is it worth it to do this kind of thing? And George Will said, 
haven't we advanced a rather banal reason <laughs> for spaceflight, like nonstick frying pans and the like? And Tom Wolf almost jumped out of his seat. He said, George, you're absolutely right. This country has never had a philosophy of space exploration. Mm -hmm. And I decided, okay, well, we need one. I don't know anybody who's developing one, so I'll do that. And um, the, the first insight, which I think is the heart of the Cosmo hypothesis is all of our rationales for space flight, almost all of them are human centered. And the first thought I had when I decided to be a space philosopher was, um, what about the perspective of space or the universe, right? Why have human beings been brought to the point where we can actually leave the planet and we could do all of these things off the planet? It's, we're the product of four and a half billion years of evolution. Is there mm -hmm. something we can do to benefit the universe? And I concluded that the hypothesis was the universe is alive and self-aware and intelligent to a limited degree because we are alive, self-aware, and intelligent. Maybe the reason we've been brought to this point is to spread life, intelligence, and self-awareness into the cosmos. Mm -hmm. Perhaps that's why we are really doing this. Now, we might benefit as well. Sure. And, and the analogy I would pose is that 100, 200 years ago, we saw planet Earth as this infinite uh, resource to be exploited for our benefit. And now largely through spaceflight and the overview effect, we don't see the Earth that way. We see it as, as an entity with which we should cooperate and that we need to think about benefiting Gaia or the planet uh, while benefiting ourselves. So while it may seem a reach to talk this way about Cosma, which is what I call the universe, mm -hmm. that, you know, if we're going to benefit Cosma, I think it would be a whole new mindset for us. And I think it would have a big impact on how we do things. I don't, one thing I've tried to point out is mm -hmm. when I say philosophy, I don't mean, um, complicated abstractions i think our philosophy with which we are approaching uh what we're doing in outer space mm -hmm. right sort of examining the motives and uh uh the goals in a in a way yeah right sort of from a high from a high from a high principles level not just sort of because i want to make money or right you know um so Frank, I, I would like to ask you at least one more question. And uh, this is an easy one, I think, but uh, I, 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 you go to special lengths to use the phrase solar ecosystem rather than solar system, which is what most people refer to our planets uh, yeah. orbiting the sun as. And I just wondered if you could share kind of your, your motivations for making that shift and why you think that's important for you know consciousness, yeah. I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. I have to give credit where credit's due. That term was proposed by Arani Poro. Uh, Arani mm -hmm. uh, was very involved in creating uh, uh, the human space program uh, mm -hmm. in her role at uh, the McAuliffe Center. And as we were developing our mission statement or brand mantra, as we like to call it, uh, we were talking about expansion into the solar system. And uh, she said, couldn't we use the term solar ecosystem, which gives a, an environmental um, uh, feeling to it, and also more of a, a, 
a lot a sense of aliveness and um mm -hmm. and and less of a sense of uh, physics alone it is a system but if we say ecosystem we bring another mentality to it and uh, jared angazo who's our executive director is a strong environmentalist and he immediately supported it and everybody else just said yeah let's do that and uh, that's where it came from and i i do think it's a good it's a slight shift of three letters but i do think yeah. it it brings a different consciousness to it mm -hmm. well i also think that when you start imagining that humans are part of the solar system and not just planet earth yeah i mean it literally is true it does become an ecosystem where whoever's yeah. out there is dependent on earth and the earth is dependent on them to yeah. some extent and as time goes on it becomes more and more of a true ecosystem of trade and you know yeah exchange yeah 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 so Absolutely. well i would i would love to keep talking i have you know Tons of more questions about the overview effect and and Cosma, but we are getting uh, getting long in the tooth here. It's been been over an hour, so um, I think I do want to to wrap it up. If you have any more questions or comments, Jeff Frank, that you want to get in before we uh, wrap up here, yeah. or anything you want to say, Frank, that we kind of missed no. topic wise. No, I don't think you missed anything. I think the questions were great. I just want to you know close by thanking you for doing this. I know you have a lot of other things to do for orbital assembly. <laughs> True. And, <laughs> and I know it's not easy to put on a podcast, but I do think you're doing important work and uh, I'm glad you're doing it. And I've really enjoyed talking to both of you today and I'll come back anytime. But I also know you've got a list of really great uh, mm -hmm. other people to talk to. So I'm going to, I'm going to help you uh, herd some people uh, toward yeah, the podcast. Thank you. Well, thank we you. Really we really appreciate, appreciate that. Yeah. yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, I also, of course, recommend anyone listening. Um, you know, check out Frank's books, The Overview Effect, The Cosm Hypothesis. Um, you know, in particular, are two of, two of my favorite books. I, you know, I might have teared up a little bit reading The Overview Effect. You know, who knows? You can't prove anything. Uh, they're really, <laughs> really great reads. So, uh, you know, and of course, if you have any any questions, um, you know, any topics for future discussions people you want us to interview you know you can reach out to us uh, we thank you guys for for coming today and and watching live if you want to be on the list um, you know feel free to send us an email our email is our future in space at orbitalassembly.com and you can also find us on twitter at our future space and facebook at our future in space and i'll try to get some links in uh in the show notes uh, once this goes up on the podcast and youtube uh, so you guys can can check out some of the some of the things we've been talking about today so thank you, Frank, for uh, for talking with us. Thank and, you. And uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.